Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to what I believe is our first um, global Ursuline meeting of teachers or teach meet. Um, my name is Graham West. I'm from Brescia House School in Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, with me today co-presenting this is my colleague uh, Maria Barton from the Ursuline School in New Rochelle, New York. And before we get started, I'm going to ask um, Maria if she uh, can open and pray for us. Thank you, Graham. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome. So thrilled to be with all of you this morning. For us, it's morning here. And as we do every morning, we start our day, most every program with an Ursuline prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious and loving God, we come together today with grateful hearts, open minds, and eager spirits gathering to listen respectfully to each other, to the experience and God-given gifts that each of us bring. We are united in our Ursuline connection, and we pray that St. Angela Marici will be in our midst as we continue our work, striving to educate and empower our pupils to grow as compassionate, courageous global citizens. As we exchange our stories and experience today, our diverse perspectives and our own work, we pray that we can learn and grow from one another, and of course, further our collective Ursuline mission. In faith, hope, and love, we commend our conversation to you, Lord, and we begin today's program in your name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Maria. Um, and it's really great to see so many people have joined us from uh, all over the world. Um, before we start, it is uh, really nice also to see a lot of you with the uh, cameras off. So we do encourage you, if you could keep your camera on for us, that we could actually um, see each other. Uh, it's always nice, those of us who've done online teaching, know that, you know, talking to, actually being able to see people is a lot more fun than uh, just talking to, to blank screens. Um, so I'm just going to start off by welcoming everybody and just putting a, a bit of a run through of what we are intending to do today. So I'm just going to share my presentation. Um, Does this turn off? Okay, so um, what we're starting with uh, today is really just looking at this welcome and introduction. Then uh, Maria and myself are going to give you a roughly 20 minute sort of presentation on our journey in global virtual collaboration. Um, then we will introduce how we're going to run the breakout sessions. And the idea today is really not so much that you listen to us talking about what we have done, but really to get everybody to interact with each other. So we will have two different breakout sessions and we will explain how those work. They are, will be about 20 minutes, 20, uh, approximately 20 minutes each. At the end of that, we'll come back for a whole meeting with some feedback, questions and answers and discussion. Um, please feel free to use the chat as we are going on during uh, the meeting, also to pose questions. We have some of our, our colleagues here, um, Laura Van Houten and Genevieve Savory Williams, who are moderating the chat and we'll answer any questions or we'll hold questions perhaps to be answered later on. Um, and I really hope that you are excited about the possibilities that we have of collaborating with each other in this um, sort of post COVID world where we have access to such great communication and collaboration technology. I'm gonna start by just by running a quick poll. So uh, two questions are gonna come up on your screen um, if we can launch the poll. And really, they're just to get us a sense of, of, of who's here and um, what, what you've done before. So if your first question is really, have you done a physical exchange with other OC Line schools before? I think, uh, you know, we, we've done with quite a few before, but I know some schools maybe haven't. And then have you been involved in any virtual projects? Have you done any online collaboration? 
um, really what we're talking about today. So that's the second question. So great, but watching the answers come in and then we will share those answers and we can um, yeah, have a chat about taking it, taking it a little bit forward. So we're nearly there. We have 72 participants here. We have about 75 attendees. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that at the end of, after this event, we will circulate everyone's contact details. If you, when you registered, you uh, um, indicated if you were happy to do that. If you were, then that spreadsheet will, that list will go out and you will have a, an opportunity to um, connect with each other as well. So you don't have to frantically take down contact details um, in breakout rooms, for example. Okay, I think we've got most of the respondents. Um, can we share the results, please? Okay, so great. We have a lot of people in the room here have done a physical exchange before, been involved in physical exchanges, or their school has, nearly 70%. But only about 47% have been involved in some kind of virtual online project uh, with other schools. So that just gives a little indication about um, the opportunity for both. And they are different, and they provide different opportunities. And uh, today we really want to explore the second one, and we hope those of you who have been involved in them will maybe get some inspiration and some connections to do something new. And those of you who haven't, maybe will make a connection and get an idea about something which you could do, which could perhaps really enrich um, your pupils. So I'm going to hand over to um, Maria, who will take us through the first part of the presentation. Thank you, Graham. And I just want to echo and say thank you to our colleagues in South Africa, the whole team, even those behind the scenes for collaborating with us on this day and on our journey, because it, this in itself is a testament to our collaboration that's been ongoing. So thank you. To just advance the slide, we'll go on to a little bit of background. So um, I just wanted to give a little bit of background as to how we got to this place and what our journey really was. So like many of you and a uh, testament to the poll there, several schools throughout our network did have in-person strong connections prior and did physical in-person exchanges. But one of the great advantages of the Ursuline network is our partnerships and our sister school connection through our mission and through existing school relationships. So obviously, you know, we talked about wanting to see people on screen when that came to a halt, um, our schools in our rotation that we knew we were going to be planning exchanges with, it came to a, a quick swift stop. So that was a big um, hurdle with regard to advancing our objectives and continuing our goals for global education and the great work that we all do. So, um, but despite that, not being able to use our actual passports here in New Rochelle and in uh, South Africa, given that strong connection, we did not want it to stop. And we reached out on our side and on Graham's side to probably several schools to see if anyone had an appetite to just, you know, again, not knowing what it would bring, but to say we, we'd like to continue the communication and collaboration. So that was one thing when we had that going for us. And, um, and I, I give that to the strong Ursula network and partnerships that are throughout our network. Um, and then we have this familiarity, um, the silver lining to the pandemic that we were communicating with technology. So we had this comfort comfort level uh, due to remote learning. So we felt like we had a little bit of leverage there and we could um, give it a go. So originally about tw late 2020, we started these conversations and we started to say, we know that we've been connecting a little bit, but how do we do something more formal tied to curriculum and make sure that our students, that our goal to have them be active, wise global citizens continues despite the pandemic. So that's how we kind of started those conversations. So, um, and then you would say, well, why did you want to do this? And there was, this page probably could be two pages because there's just so many benefits for us. Uh, so much so that even though we can use our passports now, we feel that this type of collaboration and this work also gives greater access to more students to participate. So it opens up a larger community for more students, even if they wouldn't be able to go on an in-person exchange. So in our humble opinion, it should be in tandem and a hybrid is probably the perfect world. But some of the benefits, as you can see on the screen, 
Um, it strengthens our community, our shared mission through the Ursuline Network. We felt like we could look at issues that help foster empathy amongst students. It was critical, even though we couldn't do it in person, that we continue talking about global issues that affect them to understand that the world's issues are our shared right. issues. And that's a big part of the work that we all do. Um, and again, we would tie to curriculum so that we could look at diverse perspectives on either side, tying it to curriculum, but also looking at two different locations and expose pupils to very different narratives. So this was a great way to tie it to classwork and to have them deepen their understanding of global challenges or opportunities throughout the world. The other big piece of a benefit was we felt it was preparing them for world beyond their Ursuline uh, secondary education to use their global problem solving skills and to think about how to work collaboratively through solutions, team-based learning, the future of work and their careers and professions. Okay. Thanks, Maria. Um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna talk very quickly about uh, a number of different examples of collaborative projects that we've done with some different um, schools and uh, since during and since the pandemic. And then uh, Maria and I are going to pick out a few that we're then going to go into a bit more detail on to give you a bit more detail on some of the different types of projects that we've done. And that's really the first thing that I want to kind of get across here is that these collaborative projects can they vary some of them are like the first ones we did were discussion classes with our grade 11 and 12 pupils so 16 to 18 year olds, where we partnered with. Um, uh, there's an academy in St. Louis, Missouri, and we just had conversations. We put our pupils into the same virtual room, basically, as their pupils. We sent questions to each other. And this started, we, we, we initiated it in the context of the Black Lives Matter movement that kind of exploded in the United States with the, the murder of George Floyd in 2020. Uh, but then we kind of continued. We thought, well, you know, we can continue these kind of conversations. So the, that kind of discussion class was sort of the, the easy way of um, getting into the into collaboration. We then moved to a grade 12 teaching class, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, later, which was also with St. Louis. And then uh, with uh, Wilmington, uh, we looked at in Delaware, we did a, a, our first sort of project where our pupils had to work together, where we put them into groups, they had to work together, and we gave them historical concepts they had to work through in different case studies on slavery, nationalism, and colonialism. So very curriculum focused, and we're really trying to get them to enrich their curriculum and their understanding through working in a common group. A few more examples. Uh, we did a grade 11 project uh, with New Rochelle, which Maria is going to go into more detail about reaching for global equality and equity. And then also another grade 11 collaborative project, environmental racism, another example of working together. Currently, we are doing our second round, second version of the grade 11 joint teaching classes. That's the, on the Israel-Palestine conflict. And this year we're theming it as the, the roads to peace, uh, which really, well, I'm gonna go into a bit more detail on where the pupils really have to work together and we actually starting to teach together. That's a great example of, of, of some of the power of, of what this can do. And then also maybe with some of our juniors, we've done a grade eight cultural exchanges. So these would be sort of 14 year olds, 13, 14 year olds, and you could even do younger pupils who are really just sharing about what life is like at their school and comparing and just a little bit of building kind of community amongst them. So we're gonna go into some detail now on projects and Maria is gonna start with you looking at this project um, that we did with uh, Fresh House School and New Rochelle last year. Thank you. Yes, very excited to be talking about this today. And um, this visual is uh, very powerful and may, the, our friends from Russia House in South Africa uh, may recognize the work of photographer and documentary uh, photographer Johnny Miller from Cape Town. And um, you, those of you who will be in a facilitated session with Adriana Roberts and my colleague is the faculty global educator who worked on this collaboration with me. So this was a visual and a starting point for uh, the road and uh, reaching for, in, for equality and equity. So if you advance the next slide, um, I'll tell you why we use this. So uh, it was a stark reality. Um, the work that Adriana does within her upper level English class, specifically her advanced placement college level English class, she has two sections when we worked on this project, um, looks at a lot of this 
uh, work and uh, throughout the year and uh, reading and writing assignments. And she weaves in a lot of this. So it was a natural fit to work with Graham on some of the things that they were doing and uh, on the same on the same subject matter. So we use this as a platform and I'm going to have um, the folks in Russia House play this video clip because it will give you an example of how we introduced the joint lesson. Here's a striping photograph. What do you notice here? What leaps out at you? And in this photograph, what do you notice? Both of these photographs were taken from a project called Unequal Scenes by photographer Johnny Miller. Unequal Scenes is a photographic project, a platform for multimedia storytelling, and a home for creatives, activists, scientists, and journalists to connect and strategize creative approaches to make the world a more healthy, fair, and equitable place. So the framework that we built around this uh, lesson was that we knew, and we'll talk about some hurdles, but within the scope of the two uh, class classes on either side, we knew we could not have synchronous lessons given the time zone difference and the number of sections of the classes that the students were in. So we co-developed a presentation and pre-recorded on both sides, myself and Adriana, Graham West and Laura Van Houten, and we recorded a shared lesson that we played and used independently in both schools. And that worked for a really brilliant kickoff. It kind of level set the project. And at that point, they, the students on either side became familiar with the other teachers and the work that they were going to do. So then we broke out our groups into um, different groups of six and they worked in, um, they did not choose, we put them in groups, the teachers did that. And we focused on different aspects of inequality and inequity. And if you think about the time that we were in, this was a very important lens given the pandemic. So it was very timely. And it was a lot of the conversation in either, in either countries and either schools around current affairs and current events, what they were all going through and what they were seeing in the news. So we have the geographic scope of our schools, both of them suburban settings, yet surrounded by different socioeconomic areas that were directly affected by various aspects of inequality and inequity. So it allowed the global citizens, your students, to work on something um, to give their perspective from their own setting, but learn about how this is affected in a different school, a different Ursuline school. So the other piece is that it also was uh, synchronous and asynchronous. So as I said, we recorded something as a, a, a level playing field to get everybody indoctrinated into the work. Then we had one synchronous lesson, which we planned based on schedules. And then the pupils were asked to schedule time in their own groups to work on the research and the presentation. The teachers, we created a framework where they could only present for three to four minutes. They were to record something collaboratively. We gave them a template of like five slides. This is what we wanted them to present on for assessment. And they created it and submitted it through the, um, the Microsoft Teams tool. Then instead of sharing it synchronously, which was not feasible, each, each class viewed and discussed the collaborative work in their own class time independently and had discussion. This is just a view of the 10 different aspects and perspectives that we broke the students into groups and had them do their research and share their learnings. I wanted to just play a short clip as an example of something that we received. This would be an example of a portion of the recorded submission from one of the groups. So this is how they recorded and submitted one of their, uh, their slides with their voiceover. The origins of inequity and inequality in Johannesburg can be explained through the early to mid 1900s in Alexandra and Bryanston. In 1912, when Alexandra was created, it was the only place black people could buy freehold land here we have the differences between New Rochelle and Johannesburg. In New Rochelle, the minority groups are at a disadvantage. In terms of internet access, the area with the largest percentage of racial minorities and the lowest median income, 
only 42% of its residents have internet access. This is opposed to the area with the least minorities and highest average income, where 100% of its residents have access to the internet. The opposite is shown in Johannesburg, where only 13% of the population is white, yet they are mainly the ones with internet access. Thank you. The origin. And then, as I alluded to, just to set expectations, it, this was not a perfect journey. So we did have hurdles to work through. And I think in every collaboration, you have to be flexible and prepare for things will go off, off, off plan. So certainly what we worked through at the start was planning, 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 a lot of scope of work and expectations. And we started out, let's just start somewhere and see what we can accomplish. But we felt like we definitely exceeded our expectations. So in terms of challenges, we had great partners and the teachers that we work with on both sides, the acknowledgement that you are going to have to disconnect from your syllabus a little bit and be flexible in terms of um, this might not be exactly to what you planned for, but um, we felt the benefits certainly outweighed getting back on track, so to speak. And then, of course, the time zones. Uh, South, uh, Brescia House is seven hours ahead of New York. So in terms of when their students are finishing their day, so there was commitment on their sides for the students to work a little later at night or after extracurriculars. And on our side, our students came in as early as a quarter to eight in the morning. Uh, sorry, so, uh, yes, very early in the morning before uh, classes started on a late day. So um, and then they gave time at night as well. So the time zone uh, aligning technology, as I I said we were all used to hybrid remote learning but we are on different learning platforms so we had to do a little planning there and then uh, um, sort of setting expectation for the students because uh, as you all know best they want to know what's expected of them what do they have to do the the grading the assessment all of that so we work through um, and simplify that for them so that they really could give it their all without worrying about um, certain expectations that they might normally do in, in your class. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Um, I'm going to yeah, just pick up from there. And I'm going to talk quickly about uh, two different uh, projects or examples that we've, uh, that we've done. We've done quite a few now, but these are two that really stand out for me as being um, a little bit different and, and uh, quite successful. So the first one was a, uh, an example of a pupil-driven lesson. So what happened here is we were working with um, school in uh, Missouri, in St. Louis, who were looking at post-slavery United States. And we presented, five of our senior pupils presented a lesson with their teacher, that was me. Um, we presented a lesson to their class. So our pupils prepared a lesson and they presented a lesson to their class on post-apartheid South Africa. So was, the idea was to sort of look at a society which is gone through a, uh, a similar kind of process and has come out of that and we're, we're only 30 years down the line. So they presented the lesson on how they as 17 year olds understand post-apartheid South Africa. And then we had great questions and answers uh, be between the, the, the two groups. So for my pupils who were, there were only five of them who participated in it, it was a voluntary program, they learned a huge enormous amount. Um, we spent uh, probably about two hours just in the debrief after the first lesson just going, while you know answering questions and, and debriefing the type of questions they were asked and the questions they were able to ask their American counterparts around this theme. For the American counterparts, they got an insight into a, a, a history that they're not familiar with and a, a different parallel story that they're not terribly familiar with and uh, were able to sort of link some uh, questions, some of the ideas that they have, having understood the South African story. So that was a, a great example. I don't have pictures of it, and that's just one of the points here is that you know, these things happen kind of organically, and I, that just happened. We planned it, we did it, and, and I didn't take make a big, you know, take photos of it and put stuff up, and I kind of wish I, I, I had now, but it was one of, the, one of the most successful lessons that we had done. The second one we've done, and we've done this, this is now that we're running it currently, it's the second year we're running this, and it's on the Israel, conflict in Israel-Palestine. It's a module that we teach in South Africa, and one of the reasons we teach it is because it has such close parallels to our own uh, struggle against apartheid and transition or end of apartheid and transition to democracy in South Africa and the difficulty that that the that the situation has not been able to have a similar path if you look at Israel Palestine. Um, so we, what we do in this lesson is we take the pupils basically through through this year we're doing three last year we did four 
collaborative synchronous lessons. So what that means is they are all in a room together in a, in a Zoom room or a Teams room, and we are delivering a lesson to all of them. So each week, a different teacher delivers a different lesson, and we planned out the syllabus according according to this. So we partnered with, with New Rochelle, a uh, teacher there by the name of Chris Bratt, who's got one of our uh, facilitators today as well. And we managed to work out that we could do late afternoons or evenings here, and of the early mornings sometimes over there, we could, we could try and work with time zones to make this work, to be in these synchronous lessons. Now, the synchronous lesson would look like um, a little bit like this, a bit of a presentation, some polls, some breakout rooms, uh, and we didn't put any assessment output to it. So there was no product that they were being assessed on. We wanted to take away any kind of marks pressure from this. The focus was much more on dialogue and connections. So as we took them through, the structure of each lesson was typically some sort of historical overview, even though they were looking at it in their own classes, bring them together. We used uh, poll questions quite a lot and variety of stimuli as well. So a lot of video, for example, short video clips, then ask them a question, poll them a question, what do they think about that? Then send them into a breakout room where they're in cross breakout rooms with maybe four of our, our pupils and four of their pupils together to discuss that. Then they would come back into, and then sometimes we'd rerun the poll or we'd get some feedback as well. Um, here's an example from the third lesson, which is the poll we put to them was, is violence justified in this conflict? And is it fair to call Palestinians terrorists? So we ask questions like, is terrorism, you know, is violence ever right? And, and we got some quite interesting um, answers. We asked them, is terrorism ever a legitimate uh, tool? And um, often the, the groups are, are quite almost evenly divided on some of these questions. And then that leads to some really good breakout rooms and discussion. This year, they are actually making a short little project uh, within the context of how do we find a pathway to peace in Israel-Palestine where each group there's 10 pupils in a group, mix of the from the two schools, uh, putting together a short presentation. We've given them a lot of structure, a lot of scaffolding on really different ideas about how peace could possibly be obtained. And then they're going to have to present that and answer questions on it. So things like a one state solution, a two state solution, different kinds of borders, role of the UN and things like that in there. Just some examples of pupils working. This is last year in terms of the presentation. So we'd often have them together in a in a room and then we would um get for the presentation part and then they would go into separate places for their breakout rooms so even though they're at school they're working on a device and they are individually connected not just all sitting necessarily uh, in a classroom so we felt that we got a lot of strong feedback from this a lot of positive feedback from 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 particularly this exit this project but many others as well and it really did open their eyes up to kind of different thinking and different ideas. Crucially, it involved every student. So as opposed to the physical exchanges, which are fantastic, but they are pretty small in number in terms of the number of pupils who are able to go to this, this program enabled, involved every single student in the classroom was part of it. And some of their feedback is there. I still talk to my group members. I was surprised by how similar we are. We also had to work through hurdles, just as Maria said. Uh, different time zones, finding time in the calendar, maybe being able to make it work. And we have to be flexible. We have to be adaptable. And we have to ask, sometimes ask our pupils, girls, you're going to have to do this at home. You know, you're going to have to join, we run a lesson in the late afternoon or something like that. And we always, some of the pupils struggled with as well. And also with the usual kind of things of working within group work and working in specific parameters. I'm going to hand over to Maria to take us through really some of the key learnings from these projects that we've done. Thank you. As we go into uh, think about breakouts, some of the learnings we wanted to share, again, we're still learning as well, but um, the key takeaways are really that preparation on the front end and planning, planning, planning is vital. So before you just, you can just leap into it, but we recommend that you really think through some of the things that we've spoken about this morning. And that from the student's perspective, as well as the faculty's perspective, it, you know, it is new, but to use a variety of media and stimuli, as Graham gave some examples, and I gave some examples in the those two case studies, they really keep the students engaged as you probably find in your, your usual classwork as well. 
And then no matter how much planning, you're going to have to be flexible and have a plan B, particularly if technology or in South Africa, sometimes the power is a little erratic, but that's all good. And that's part of the global citizenship and global learning. So that flexibility. Um, we also found that group discussion, meaning um, even though when we started out, it was largely due to the scheduling, but to um, use the synchronous time to share as a big group or have Q&A in that large format is not really ideal. The, the, um, the secret sauce was really in the smaller breakout sessions and then the delivery and sharing with regard to the smaller post discussions um, with their teachers. And then, um, so if you could have plan for quality discussions after the lessons, that would be great, depending on how much time in your curriculum you can um, allocate to this type of, of collaboration. And then um, we found the feedback from the students on both sides reiterated that they really enjoyed content being prepared and presented from other teachers from other Ursuline schools. It was quite valuable for them and it gave them and it was really the underpinning of a lot of the shared learning and sort of the global diverse perspectives. So that part was really great. And I would encourage you to include that in your planning. Um, so recommendations would be, you know, these are examples, but at the end of the day, you know what's best for both your curriculum, your school, like what are your broader global education goals for your particular school? Keep that within your planning context and also for your own students. So obviously you probably have objectives for your own students that will help them grow as global citizens. So make sure you voice that in the planning and so that you're incorporating what is gonna work best for keeping yourself and your students on track. And then be open-minded and creative. So dream big as I, I even tell our students and my own children. So what's that one innovative idea you wish you could do, but you know, it, it would be valuable if you could do it, but you, it's not built into curriculum. What would be really creative? And if somebody on the other side comes back with something that sounds like, oh, I didn't think of that, really try to, to look at it from your perspective and maybe it, it could be worked in. And then even though lastly, we presented some examples and you're gonna hear more examples in your breakout, just always remember that um, it's a journey and there's no one size fits all. It's going to be lots of iteration and different paths to get to what you would deem. And I truly feel even just bringing students together is, uh, is successful. That's what we want. We want them to be talking to each other, collaborating and meeting. And your curriculum goals are super important, but what I hear time and time again, we just really loved getting to know each other and making those connections team to team, student to student. The first one we did, the, the Johnny Miller uh, Inequity Project, we no sooner finished than the students in the middle of pandemic, of course, said, you know, but can we go next year? Can we can we get on a plane and go? When can we book our tickets? So that's the spirit you want to really um, inspire in these types of projects, as well as academics, academic learning and success. Thanks, Maria. And, and just to echo that, I mean, uh, working even with the hurdles, things like time zones, these are really good things for our, our pupils to learn to navigate, learn to navigate what it means to work in an international cross-cultural team. Um, it's gonna prepare them for the future world that they, they are entering into. So we're now gonna to move to the um, next section, which is the looking at the moving into breakout rooms. So breakout rooms are, sorry, I'm just trying to get them up. There they are. We will have two 20 minute rounds of, of breakout rooms, approximately 20 minutes. We will monitor the time. There are five topics to choose from in each round. So we'll put up the topic shortly. Each room does have a facilitator, but they're not there to present information. Really what we want is this is a place for discussion and for ideas and just to, to share a little bit, maybe just starting with an introduction about what you teach and where you're from. And, um, and then if, if we're hoping that people will say something and it'll trigger an idea in somebody, somebody else. If the numbers are too big, we've got um, about 80 participants in this call. So um, we've got five rooms that are happening. So if, if there's one group, one, one group which is really big, please consider maybe moving to another room uh, just to, to, to get the conversation being a little bit, a little bit better. We look for 15 to 20 in, in each room. Um, after about 20 minutes, we're going to change them and we want you to meet different people really and look at and look at different topics. So we'll monitor them and, and, and see how they go as well. So in round one, the first breakout rooms there are art and music, cultural exchanges, current events, humanities, and the St. Angelo Ursuline mission. 
Um, so I know a lot of people put down as one of the interest areas cultural exchanges, but if everyone goes into there, then no one's going to go into any of the others. So um, we will, if, if one room is getting really big, then we will ask you if we can move some people to some of the other rooms, please. And then in round two, when we kind of come back, we're not really going to come back for uh, uh, much of a meeting. We're going to come, go straight into the second room, um, which is literature, model United Nations, sciences, social justice issues, and languages. After both breakout rooms, then we will be coming back into the, the main room. So what we really hope from, from Maria and my side is that, that we are able to use this as the start of really building more of an online community of, of Ursuline educators across the world. Um, please email, call, keep in contact, um, email us, any questions, any insights, any ideas. Um, we really want to, we really want to um, connect with people. We want to build the, this connection and expand um, this kind of this kind of connection. And our hope is actually that from here we will, this is the beginning of starting a more regular and more permanent online Ursuline community that can build collaboration projects and get involved in these things. So we're going to thank you for, for listening to us. Um, I hope it was um, informative and we're now going to open the breakout rooms and start that process. Thank you. Mm -hmm.